Hey, folks, Roller Martin here broadcasting live from San Francisco site of Blavity's Afrotech Conference, the third annual Afrotech Conference. Coming up on this edition of Roller Martin Unfiltered, I will talk with uh, the CEO uh, of Blavity, uh, Morgan DeBond. Also, we'll talk with tech attorney Barry Williams about black folks in technology. More than 4,000 people are here, and it is an amazing, amazing conference. We'll tell you more about it. Also, the drama continues in Florida uh, as the battle continues continues to reek to count the ballots involving the uh, campaign of Andrew Gillum versus Ron DeSantis, but also Senator Bill Nelson against Governor Rick Scott. Uh, the numbers are getting smaller. Now Donald Trump has thrown his hat into the ring in terms of saying threatening to send attorneys down to Florida uh, in some ways to stop the recount. Really? Is that what he's talking about? Also on today's show, folks, uh, Stacey Abrams, uh, she continues her fight in Georgia trying to get Brian Kemp under 50.1 to force a December 4th runoff. We'll give you an update of what's happening in Georgia. We'll be joined by River Jesse Jackson Sr. Talk about the meaning of these midterms for African Americans. Also, Donald Trump continues to attack black female journalists. We'll be joined by the president of the National Association of Black Journalists to talk about his latest attacks, uh, calling again stupid questions and even calling April Ryan a loser. And so, folks, Michelle Obama makes it clear she will not forgive Donald Trump nor his wife Melania for being birthers. We got all that more. Folks, it's time to bring the funk from Afrotech here in San Francisco on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah. Yeah. It's on go, 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 y'all. Yeah. Yeah. It's rolling, Martin. Yeah. 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 Rolling with rolling now. Yeah. He's funk, he's fresh, he's real, the best you know. He's rolling, Martin. All right, folks, uh, I'm here in San Francisco, site of the third annual Afrotech Conference. Uh, more than 4,000 attendees uh, here. This is all about uh, black folks in tech. Afrotech, hope you got that. Uh, sitting with me right now is Morgan DeBond. She is, of course, the, uh, the founder, one of the founders of Blavity, uh, the CEO of the company. They're the ones who started this conference. Uh, and, uh, Morgan, as we, lo as we look out here, Companies from all over uh, Silicon Valley, all kind of tech companies. You got Microsoft, you got LinkedIn, you got Google, you got eBay. Uh, and then, of course, companies like Target and Bank of America. And all down uh, the line here, uh, more companies are here. So is this about, is this a tech conference? Is it about startups? Is it about jobs? What actually, actually is Afrotech? So Afrotech is a space that we've created to for all of that, Roland. Like, it is... One, getting people into tech. Two, teaching people who want to get into tech about how to find a job. How do you even do a coding interview, right? Why are you, how do you pitch startups to investors? What does that vocabulary look like? So it's all about connections and learning and also making sure that people feel seen and feel like they can share their stories in a place where they don't have to be scared about raising their hands about something that they don't necessarily know. No, Blavity started this. Okay, so is Blavity a tech company or is it a media company? Blavity is both. We are a tech company um, that focuses on media and content and creating platforms. And so this is a part of what, what you do. Uh, you, this thing has grown. This is the third year. You're in your third different place. Uh, and so if somebody's out there, they're watching this, uh, who is a person that should be here? Oh, man, there's so many people who should be here. Uh, that student sitting in Kansas City who is trying to figure out, okay, what do I do in my career. I don't necessarily want to go to Wall Street. I don't necessarily want to play ball. I don't necessarily, you know, want to work at you know, corporate at, at, at some of these companies. I want to start my own. So this is a great place to go and meet the top founders, people who raised millions and millions of dollars at the age of 22, 27, 28 that look like you. Um, this is also really great for those people who are working at some of these big tech companies who are thinking about, okay, what does it look like if I switch to a startup? 
what does that lifestyle look like? They get to see and they get to meet people and actually interact with them face to face and, and build a relationship. Uh, and so, uh, first of all, you've had various CEOs who have been uh, giving presentations, uh, walking folks through who want to be entrepreneurs. Also, uh, Common and Robert Glasper and others, uh, they were also uh, on stage as well. And so, uh, it's, a, it's a good mix of folks who are here. Yeah, there's just so many different types of people who are here. You know, I think at the end of the day, tech and culture, you know, black people are early adopters of technology, right? We're, we have the best content on Twitter, early adopters of Instagram, Periscope, Vine, birds, limes, right? Like, it is important that our community really considers tech as a part of our career trajectory and things that, that we can actually build wealth as we become owners in this country of different startups and different platforms. And so uh, what's next for Blavity in terms of obviously uh, you guys just completed uh, a big round. You raised a bunch of money. Uh, and so what's next? So many things. More of this, a lot more of bringing people together, uh, making sure that on the, on the digital side, which is our main business, on our websites and our Instagram, we're making sure that we continue to tell the best stories and create opportunities for other people to use our platform to share their own stories. So obviously uh, video is a huge part of that as well. Y'all started that way, but then you reverted back to the traditional way. Yeah, we started a video. Honestly, I was broke at the time, so we didn't have enough money to do a lot of the production that we needed to. We're actually opening up an office in Atlanta um, in a few months that's going to focus on engineering, design, data, and also some video. So we're looking forward to, to kind of going back to our roots. Yeah. Well, certainly uh, gl glad to see you. Uh, certainly thanks for inviting me. Glad to bring Roland Martin Unfiltered here as well. Uh, certainly it's been uh, rather exciting seeing a lot of the folks who are here. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a, a fun-filled weekend. Hey, hey, I can't stay for the whole weekend. I, I got to go to Detroit. Uh, I got to go uh, give a speech there. Uh, but uh, we'll be sure to block off this weekend. So and it, and it's, is it held the same time every year? Same time every year here in the Bay Area. Uh, we have some big announcements that we'll be sharing soon about the future of, of what Afrotech looks like and how we'll continue to make sure that as many people as possible can come to it. Right. So we look forward to being here next year. All right. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. All right, folks. Uh, again, uh, we're going to be uh, here uh, all day. Then, of course, I hit you to Detroit. Uh, let's get to some other stories we've been covering. First of all, Florida is a huge, huge issue that's happening there. The Andrew Gillum campaign, uh, he is focused uh, on this whole recount. Uh, it has gotten down to the margins. I have shrunk in a uh, significant way. And, of course, it has led to Republicans being, frankly, upset uh, that with the recount. Uh, what's interesting is, as you look at what's going on, uh, you now have the, the battle over Broward County. Uh, Donald Trump is saying that the head of the Broward County elections should be fired. Uh, Governor Scott, uh, he is suing election supervisors in Broward and Palm Beach, alleging uh, that they were doing things illegally. S Scott's camp wants to invest, wants to invest the voting records. And so all of that is going on. All of that is going on right now. Uh, and again, Scott is also calling on Florida officials to investigate what is happening there as well. Uh, even though no, no fraud has been found, they're making that allegation. And even Donald Trump, and today talking to reporters, is calling on law enforcement to investigate. The question is, investigate what? Andrew Gillum released a written statement yesterday. Today was the first day he actually made a public comment. He says... All ballots must be counted. Hey, everybody. It's uh, Andrew Gillum here, uh, mayor of Tallahassee, uh, Democratic nominee for governor of the state of Florida. I want to start out by uh, saying uh, once again from the bottom of my heart uh, and the, from the bottom of, of RJ's heart, I just spoke with Chris King and, and Kristen King. Uh, we're all so, so deeply appreciative of all of your support. Uh, as you know, we went out all across this state. We worked hard for every single vote uh, that we received. Uh, we are looking that every single vote be counted, uh, whether it's an absentee vote, whether you voted on election day, whether it is a provisional ballot. Uh, we want every vote counted. Uh, we didn't go across this state talking to uh, folks in red county and blue counties and purple counties uh, not to have uh, them have their say. And so uh, I want you to know that in spite of um, uh, the fact that, 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 that we're uh, a little bit down in the numbers, um, we're hopeful that every single vote will be counted in this race. And that way that all of us can walk away feeling extremely confident about what each and every one of us did uh, to go out here and to have our say in this election. 
This election has never been about me. You heard me all along the trail talk about the fact that this is about us, uh, that power sees nothing without a demand, uh, that we've got to be willing to show up every single day and demand our seat at the table. Uh, well, we're sitting at the table. Uh, and now it's important that we ensure that every vote uh, be counted in this process. Uh, I'm so thankful again for everything that you've done to help us out along this way. Uh, I would be uh, dishonest if I didn't say that this uh, uh, wasn't hard. This is extremely hard. Uh, but you know what? The fight for progress, the fight for change, the fight for what it is we want is hard. Uh, and that just means that you've got to, again, stiffen your spine and square your shoulders to the task. I'm prepared to do that. We've been prepared to do that all along the way, and we're continuing that fight today. So all I've got to say is let's count every vote and let's bring it home. Take care, everybody. All right, folks, that was Andrew Gilliam speaking today. Now, the supervisor of elections in Palm Beach County, uh, Susan Marie uh, Boucher, she had some choice words for Governor Rick Scott. Very unfortunate that some of the highest elected officials in our country are trying to disrupt our democracy because they don't like the demographics of our voters. I would wish that they would allow us to continue to count the ballots. We're just doing our job in accordance with law. How is that disrupting you? I'll, I'll it's to, not disrupting me. It's disrupting you in the public. I want you to clarify when you talk about I'm the not going to clarify the that demographics the demographics of our, of our county, they don't like them, and you know why. All right, folks, so one of the issues that the folks have been facing is the authentication of provisional ballots. And the deadline has passed for most people to do so, but that is not the case in a couple of counties in Georgia, DeKalb County and Gwinnett County. This is what Stacey Abrams tweeted out earlier. DeKalb and Gwinnett County voters, if you cast a provisional ballot, you have until 8 p.m. today to go to your county election office and verify your ballot. Look up your office here. Questions? Call the protection hotline. Now, 1-888-730-5816, 1-888-730-5816. Now, counties expect to count what they have as certified results on Tuesday. Uh, Stacey Abrams and the third-party candidate need about 25,000 votes combined to force a runoff. How, uh, now, of course, that's a whole lot. Uh, however, uh, uh, what is happening there, this is a huge deal. And what they believe is that with the number of provisional ballots also absentee ballots that are still being mailed in, such as military votes also that come in later, they believe they have a shot. Lawsuits are being filed there in Georgia. Uh, they are still pending. And so we have been talking with Black Voters Matter and others about this, and that's what's been going on uh, there in Georgia. So battles taking place all across uh, those two states because you still have contested elections, but not just there. You still have a contested election for the Senate seat in Arizona. They're still counting ballots there as well, and it's been going back and forth. The Democratic candidate, she is up in that race, and it's been back. She's been up, she's been down, she's been up, she's been down. Let's bring in our panel right now. Dr. Cleo Monago, social political analyst and activist. Kim Niklasik, a political group, uh, conservative political commentator. Eugene Craig, Republican and CEO of the Eugene Craig Organization. Um, uh, Eugene, I want to start with you first off. If all the folks there watching understand, it's very loud in here. And so if you see me holding my earpiece, it's so I can actually hear uh, folks are talking. Eugene, starting with you, when you look at all of these threats being made by Governor Rick Scott, by Donald Trump, when it comes to what's going on here, the bottom line is this is a very, very, very close election. And so you, they want all votes to be counted. Do you believe it is helpful to hear Rick Scott and Donald Trump threatening election officials in Florida? It's absolutely not helpful. Um, I think they're very fearful. Uh, I mean, look, you know, uh, uh, Rick Scott's holding on to a roughly 15,500 vote margin. Uh, DeSantis is holding on to roughly about 34,000 vote margin right now. Um, you know, and as provisional ballots and absentee ballots come in, um, especially from uh, counties in South Florida and Central Florida, uh, they know how those votes are probably going to break, and it's not going to be for them. Um, but I do think the one major development of the day, uh, you know, Rick Scott, you know, asked for the you know, Florida Department of Law Enforcement to step in and investigate voter fraud. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement stepped in and said, hey, there will not be an investigation because we don't see any instances of voter fraud. 
All right, Kim, let's talk about the attitude there of, again, Scott and Donald Trump. Uh, your assessment, uh, do you believe that they are behaving properly uh, by threatening Florida officials alleging fraud where there's no evidence? Uh, well, no, that doesn't help any situation, um, obviously. But, you know, I think what we're missing here is the fact that I think all of these men in this race, they're honorable stand-up guys. And I think they really want the truth. I think they want to know if they won fair or square. I don't think anyone wants to, you know, go Who's inside honorable? and say, hey, I'm sorry? Who's honorable, honorable and stand-up? <laughs> What's that? I'm Who? sorry. Who did you who you say they are honorable stand up guys? Who? Yes, those in the race, Gillum, Scott, DeSantis. Do you think they're not? Well Oh no no no. I'm just making sure you oh. you weren't talking about Donald Trump, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about everyone in the race. They want to win fair and square. Nobody wants it Thank to you. be pushed their way. They want to win fair and square. Well Leo. I, I hope that's true, but I mean not unless the people who are running against Gillum are doing a pushback to what Trump's doing. As far as I'm concerned, they're, they're, they're just as involved with the corruption as Trump is. I'm just amazed. Well, I'm not amazed. Let me take that back. I just hope that people are really clear on that what Trump is attempting to do is corruption. I want us to be real clear that we're not hearing things or our logic is not going off when we think that it's really strange to call actually counting the votes from citizens and see what the exact number is, calling that problematic and something to, to actually investigate. I want us to take advantage of our common sense and understand that that's crazy. Because what the Democratic Party is trying to do is find out exactly what the citizens said. And for Trump to actually try to interrupt that with some kind of implications of fraud is insane. So I just want us to, rem to actually allow ourselves to acknowledge that. Because sometimes we're so amazed and shocked by how ridiculous things are, we don't let, us, let it sit in that this is really, really crazy. And these people are very desperate. And what's happening in Florida and Georgia is unprecedented. I mean, that, that state, Florida, is one of the most racist, historically racist states and murder states of black people in the union. And now they have the potential of having a black governor. Atlanta has a very similar history in terms of black people not having power on the statewide basis. So it's pretty powerful. And, and they're fearful, people like Trump and his, and his folks, and they're desperate. So they're calling honest interest in counting the votes fraud. That's crazy. Uh, folks, you talk about what's happening here. Of course, Donald Trump, uh, some other news, the Wall Street Journal uh, dropped a serious story uh, with the receipts saying, showing that Donald Trump was indeed heavily involved in paying off uh, a porn star and a Playboy model. Uh, and, of course, uh, he initially denied he had any involvement with that. Said it was about Michael Cohen with the Wall Street Journal. They're reporting uh, that Michael Cohen told investigators that Trump was heavily involved in uh, in this. Now, Kim, let, let's just be honest. It's not like any of us <laughs> was shocked at all that Donald Trump was involved in paying off a porn star. Nobody is shocked to act as if Michael Cohen was acting on his own behalf. You and I both know that was BS from the beginning. <laughs> okay, well, when did this, this information drop? Was it just now? Because I haven't seen this yet. Just, okay, Kim, the, it, Kim, it dropped five hours ago in the Wall Street Journal. I did not see this. I'm sorry. I did not get the memo. I worked. I worked. <laughs> okay, all day and also long. the Wall Street Journal so is a conservative it, newspaper will, owned by Rupert Murdoch. And when I read it, I will comment on it. Because Michael Cohen, I mean, come on. Now we're supposed to believe anything Michael Cohen says. Before, Michael Cohen was a trash guy, trash lawyer. You guys used to trash him all the time. But now he's a legitimate guy and a legitimate lawyer. So no, 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 when no, I no. have a chance to read now, it, hold I will up, now, let Kim. you know. See, Kim, you're saying we're trashing Michael Cohen. You're, now Donald Trump is calling him a trash lawyer. The left has Before, always trashed Donald Michael Trump was saying Cohen. he was a brilliant lawyer. The left has always trashed Michael Cohen. Okay, I give Michael Cohen as much credibility uh, uh, as I give Omarosa. Eugene, None. I find this to be laughable. <laughs> it, it, Eugene, it's... I find this to be laughable because Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani called Michael Cohen brilliant yeah, and amazing I mean, he, he lawyer. And then, of course, when he started, when he got busted and started telling the truth, oh, he's trash. He did no work. It, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy how uh, one can uh, flip on one uh, after their hand has been caught in a cookie jar. Um, but to speak to the Wall Street Journal article, um, you know, the thing is this. 
the allegations that Cohen made uh, are, are backed up by uh, AMI and their founder, who has been given an immediate deal by the Southern District of New York and also the Mueller, uh, of T. Mueller um, and others. I mean, there, it, it's, it's been corroborated. Um, and so, you know, that's going to open up a whole lot of uh, new legal, uh, uncharted territory and water for Donald Trump. Uh, because I mean, it, it, the criminal exposure is not just the word of Michael Cohen, which was under oath, um, but, you know, it's not just his word. It's now, you know, being corroborated by, you know, Alan Waxenberg and by, uh, you know, AMI and, and, you know, and how they, you know, work together on multiple uh, situations of paying off people. But in this particular one where it was to... Uh, conceal, you know, conceal it from, you know, essentially, you know, federal uh, reporting, which, by the way, you know, hey, they could have just, you know, smart folk would have just opened up a super PAC and paid them through a super PAC and called it a day and wouldn't be in this trouble. But this is the guy. All right, so I, I have to put the noise reduction headphones on so I can hear, because I literally can't hear nothing y'all are saying, but now I can. Uh, so, Cleo, again, Wall Street Journal drops this article. But here's, I think, the problem, Cleo. What mainstream media did, they pretty much said to Donald Trump, oh, he can pretty much do whatever. It's yep. no big deal. Uh, and so they've excused so many much, much of his behavior. His, his supporters, they don't care. Uh, those conservative evangelicals, they don't care he paid off a porn star. They don't care he lied about it. Uh, their deal is like he can do pretty much whatever the hell he wants. Yeah, and one big contradiction are the evil, I mean, the e in bad, how you say that word? Evangelical. Thank you. I can't even say it. <laughs> How they're supporting Trump's p pornographic interests, because they're supposed to be, you know, squeaky clean and into p proper family values and blah, blah, blah. And the president is a hoe, and <laughs> nobody wants to admit that he's the hoe in chief. Oh, my God. And, well, it's true. Well, and so, I mean, you. look, we're, we're in the United States, which happens to be a, a three-ring circus, at least three rings, might be four rings, and Donald's case. But hey, <laughs> it is what it is. I mean, you know, a lot of what's going on here is not based on rational behavior or based on decency. It's based on power. Right. And as we've talked about before, Donald Trump is the ringleader right now, the, the face of white power retainment in the United States. And so if he brought a, 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 a prostitute in front of the White House and did her there, people on his team would write it off and sue Florida for, for fraud because they want to count the citizens' real votes. It's insane. Yeah, yeah I would say this. Cleo does have a point. Uh, all right. He said Cleo has a point. I was going to say, you know, a never-ending whole fate doesn't matter when, we, uh, when power is at stake. And, uh, you know, Paula White and crew have uh, made that determination. Yeah. All right, then. Uh, folks, now, here's the deal. Of course, on, on a Wednesday, there was a news conference where Donald Trump just acted like a damn fool uh, to deflect as much as he can from massive Republican losses. Now, let's go ahead and get, before I uh, get to this here, uh, I got to deal with Kim. Because, Kim, you see the tweet out questioning a blue wave. Kim, you do know on Tuesday, 355 seats across the country flipped from Republican to Democrat. That's cute. Almost 40 in the House. That's cute. You question a blue wave. I question a blue uh, wave. Uh, what the hell, Kim? How can you <laughs> question a blue wave when 355 seats flipped? La I recall when you had seats that flipped under Obama, y'all called that a red wave. Did we call it a red wave or the red tsunami? No, y'all called it a red wave. <laughs> now, make up your mind. So what is it, no, Kim? No, I mean, Look, seriously. Look, take the well, ass whooping, but don't try to spin it. No, no, no. You guys, you, oh, look. The left should have gotten the Senate as well. If this was an actual wave, you would have gotten the Senate and the oh, House, and you oh, did not. Oh, they should have gotten it. If this was a real wave like they were talking about wave, you would have had both. You didn't get it. But now, I, will, I want to Kim, point out. Kim. Let me point out that this is not a win for the American people because what we're going to see is the House and the Senate fighting with each other and they're not going to get anything done. So this isn't really a win for anyone. No, Kim, it is a win. It is a win, Kim, for the American people because now you're actually going to see accountability. For two years, Republicans in the House would not hold Donald Trump accountable for anything, Eugene. And clearly, the American people said, enough is enough. When a Lucy McBath beats a Karen Handel in a conservative district, 
formerly held by Tom Price and Newt Gingrich, Eugene, uh, that's them sending a signal to people like him saying, <laughs> we're tired of y'all being in control of both chambers. We want some accountability. Yeah. Eugene, go ahead. You know, Kim's a dear friend, but I, I do have to respectfully disagree. <laughs> um, you know, but there was a blue wave, and it was, I, I can it to what happened in 2010. You know, we didn't take back both chambers right away, and we didn't grab the Senate until four years later. But, you know, the country, uh, you know, is, is yearning and literally, you know, screaming for somebody to stand up to Donald Trump. And what you saw on Tuesday was, you know, a flip of, of right now, I believe, of 32 seats, um, the 32 heavily gerrymandered seats, you know, like, you know, Georgia 6, uh, you know, uh, 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 like, you know, Pete Sessions uh, you know, in uh, Florida, like Brian, I mean, in uh, Texas, like Brian Mass in Florida. Uh, me 11, Utah. I mean, there were there were seats that that were purposely gerrymandered to be held onto by Republicans for years, maybe decades, um, that were overcome by massive Democrat turnout. I mean, even in Maryland, I mean, you know, Governor Hogan got reelected, but we got decimated down ballot. I mean, and, and Ruby red counties. Got it. All right, folks. Uh, also, uh, of course, after uh, on Wednesday, Donald Trump uh, attacked female journalists. He continued, first of all, he attacked Jim Acosta. He attacked female journalists. Now he has continued the attack. Uh, this taking place on today. Of course, remember Yamish Alcindor, PBS NewsHour. Uh, he called one of her questions racist. Uh, now he is blasting April Ryan of the American Urban Radio Networks, calling her a loser, and then tells Abby Phillips of the Washington Post that her questions are stupid. Really? Here is Phillips' completely reasonable and proper question to Donald Trump today. It's up to him. Do you want him to rein in Robert Mueller? What a stupid question that is. What a stupid question. But I watch you a lot. You ask a lot of stupid questions. Same thing with April Ryan. I watch her get up. I mean, you talk about somebody that's a loser. She doesn't know what the hell she's doing. She gets publicity, and then she gets a pay raise, or she gets a contract with, I think, CNN. But she's very uh, nasty, and she shouldn't be. She shouldn't be. You've got to treat the White House and the office of the presidency with respect. Hi, Mr. President. Yami Shelsender with PBS NewsHour. Um, on the campaign trail, you called yourself a nationalist. Some people saw that as emboldening white nationalists. Now people are also saying that the president. I don't know why you'd that say that. That's such a racist there question. There are some people that say that no. now the Republican Party is seen as supporting white nationalists oh, because of your rhetoric. That. I don't what do you that. make of that? I don't believe it. I just, well, I don't know. Why do I have my highest poll numbers ever with African Americans? Why do I have among the highest poll numbers with African Americans? I mean, why do I have my highest poll numbers? That's such a racist question. Honestly? I mean, I know you have it written down and you're going to tell me. Let me tell you, it's a racist question. And Mr. Uh, President, I, I love ask... You know what the word is? I love our country. I do. You, call, you have nationalists, you have globalists. I also love the world. And I don't mind helping the world, but we have to straighten out our country first. We have a lot of problems. And Ms. Excuse me. But to say that, what you said, is so insulting to me. It's a very terrible thing that you said. And Mr. Okay, President, please, Mr. President, people have t you, you talked ahead. about you talked Excuse about me. middle you talked about middle class tax cuts on the campaign trail. How will you get Democrats to support that policy? You have to ask that? them. Well, hey, what's what's your plan no, no, for working me. with Democrats you know how, on my middle plan class is? tax plan? You know what my plan is? I'll ask them. And if they say yes, I'm all for it. And if they say no, there's nothing you can do because you need their votes. Go ahead. Okay, really? The person who has disrespected the White House more than anybody else now wants respect of the office of president? Give me a damn break. Joining us right now is the president of the National Association of Black Journalists, uh, Sarah Glover. Sarah, glad to have you on Roller Mart Unfiltered. Uh, what do you make of him, first of all, telling Yamish her, her question was racist, saying that Abby Phillip of CNN, the White House correspondent, or sh that she asked stupid questions, and then causing, calling April Ryan a loser? <laughs> Clearly, black women are setting Donald Trump off. Yeah, I mean, it's it's verbal abuse. You know, it is beyond the pale. It's over the top. Um, journalists and, and not just these three talented, professional black women, but journalists have been under siege since the Trump administration took office. And, you know, today to call Miss Abby Phillip, you know, to ask a stupid question, um, you know, we would say as members of the fourth estate, answer the question. <laughs> um, so, you know, these women and others 
like this week who were called out by the president, Jim Acosta and Pete Alexander. Um, we as journalists, we're unflappable. And, and those women are certainly um, some of the best and finest journalists on the White House beat in Washington. Um, and so members of the community and the citizenry should have uh, full faith in, in our press. You know, the fourth estate, it's doing its job. And these these words, they're, they're, it's verbal abuse and it's attacks on the media. Um, and, and certainly members of the media are going to continue to do their job and ask questions. And so Yamish, Abby and April um, have the full support of the National Association of Black Journalists. All of them are members. Uh, and we have uh, honored April as a journalist of the year, just like we've honored you, Roland, in years past. And uh, certainly Yamish is well known as our emerging journalist of the year. So we're very proud of the work that they do and Certainly, the American public should be proud of them, too. And look, I mean, look, he has attacked the media from day one mm -hmm. during the campaign, obviously as president as well. But it's something different because black women seem to That's set right. him off. Uh, we know John Kelly attacked Congresswoman Frederica Wilson. Uh, Donald Trump has attacked uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Uh, and then, of course, you're seeing him routinely attack uh, April Ryan and now Yamish Alcindor, now Abby Phillip. Uh, and, and, and then for a man to demand respect who gives none, what the hell? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in part of his comment back was that uh, folks should respect the office of the president. And, and people do respect the office of the president. And that's why they ask questions. Um, and so, again, those comments, those are just words. And those things are not going to impact these, uh, you know, really staunch, brave, dogged, fearless journalists. And quite frankly, it's uncalled for. And we as the NABJ, we're asking the president to stop it, to stop the verbal abuse, to stop the, the verbal attacks and not only just let journalists do their jobs, but this is about um, the American people in informing the American public. And so, you know, as a press, as a fourth estate, um, he should be working with us in the sense of um, wanting to get the message of the White House out, not just his message, but also for us to be able to hold the powerful to account. And that's a part of being a politician and a part of being a public official is, is uh, answering questions of the media. And agreed that this week something was different about uh, the ramp up of the attack and the comments today to, to Abby Phillip, really, um, you know, the third, you know, black female journalist this week to be uh, in the crosshairs of, of uh, some of these, you know, verbal attacks and for April Ryan for it to become personal and to be called a loser. Uh, it's just completely unnecessary, and, and quite frankly, it's unacceptable. Um, and I know that the Fourth Estate and other news outlets, not just the NABJ, but other journalism organizations stand with us and stand behind these journalists this week and want them to continue to do their job. And um, Jim Acosta, who had his credential, credentials to the White House, um, we've called for them, you know, they've been um, suspended. We've called for them to be reinstated. Um, and so that's a piece of of all of this puzzle. But I think, again, you've hit the nail on the head this week, um, how this kind of transpired today, where there was a personal attack on April and calling out Abby Phillip, who um, by far is one of the most brilliant journalists in Washington, and to call her question stupid um, was unnecessary. Sarah Glover, president of the National Association of Black Journalists. We're also sit on the board as vice president for digital. We certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Roland. Have a great time out in the West Coast. See you soon. All right. Okay, we'll do. All right, folks, let's go to the phone lines right now. Uh, on the phone is Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr., the founder of Rainbow Push. Uh, and uh, Reverend Jackson, how you doing? Roland, good. When they, when they took his students, all of them could have walked out together. Right. And, that, and, and Reverend, that, that's that, the that, deal. That, the union, the, 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 they, they should have walked out together because all of them got their, got their credentials back. But see, here's the deal, though, and this is the problem, Reverend, and they won't do it because during the election, when Donald Trump would not, when they threw out Jorge Ramos out of a news conference, when he wouldn't give credentials to the Washington Post or to some other media outlets, the rest of the media people, they sat there, they were silent, they were like, well, you know, this is unfortunate. No, they should have stood together and said, fine, you don't give a Jorge you don't get the Washington Post uh, uh, credentials. We're going to pack up our cameras. We're going to pack up our laptops and march out of the door. That's how you respond to bullies.
So they, they laughed at Patco, and then he came and busted them too. So did you, did you learn the lesson from Patco? Reverend, uh, I got to ask you this question. Uh, before, uh, of course, the midterm took place, took place uh, on Tuesday. We're still seeing the fight in Florida, in Georgia as well. Uh, this, to me, is indicative that we have got to have massive changes to our voting laws because we continue to have these problems, and we, 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 it just makes no sense to have to find 700 uh, pristine uh, voting booths uh, in Georgia to have uh, uh, power cables not there as well. I mean, this is an abomination for a country that should know how to conduct elections by now. Well, it shows that the, uh, the right wing who sought to deny the right to vote now seek to suppress it. They act as if voting uh, suppression is a sport. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that Stacey is not giving up. And Gillum is in, in the fight in, uh, in Florida. And it just shows that voting is just one step in the process of fighting five steps termination. Let me tell you, when this guy can threaten to take away 14th Amendment, he can take away 13th Amendment too, if, he, if he's let go. But, but I think that taking the House back is going to have some value because not only is Nash Pelosi a chair, but a number of blacks become chairs of committees. So the, I think the tools was a big deal for us, really. Um, Reverend, uh, also, when we talk about uh, this election, when we talk about uh, what's going on, uh, you saw 350-plus seats flip from Republican to Democrat on the state level, uh, on the local level, but also on the national level. Now, everybody talks about the 1,000 seats Democrats lost under Obama in his eight years, uh, but this is winning back a third of the seats they lost. That is a blue wave. Now, I know Kim doesn't want to call it that. Uh, she wants to call it a blue ripple. But the reality is Republicans lost significant power as a result of what took place on Tuesday. Is that a, repudi a repudiation of Donald Trump? Uh, even debate about isn't in, in the future. The position that were won bottom up school board seats and sheriffs and mayors, legislators, the huge sea shift and change the past Tuesday. We'll be out. Reverend, I know uh, just final question for you. I'm here at Afrotech uh, in San Francisco. Uh, and I want to, I, I got to ask you this here. What is the latest uh, on your uh, battle with Silicon Valley to diversify their boards, their ranks, their employees, but also their investing? Uh, I know, uh, again, you, you went after Apple and Facebook and Twitter. And so what is the latest with that? Well, you know, Roland, the boards is, is one step, but, but C-suites become the next step. Uh, and professional services, advertising, marketing, professional services, uh where they, the new construction in these cities where we live uh, in Africa. So we got to go to the urban dimension of it and as well as Africa. And there's no reason why an African nation would not invest in Silicon Valley. So they're public companies. Why, why can't they invest in them? And they ought to. And begin to get some of these companies located in Africa as well as urban America. All right. Remember, Jesse Jackson, CD, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you so very much. All right. All right, real quick, want to go to my panel. Uh, so, Kim, I'll ask you, <laughs> the only woman on the panel. Okay. No, 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 no. If you go, if you want to come on the panel, then you got to answer some questions. <laughs> You're the only woman on the panel. What yeah. do you make of Donald Trump attacking, uh, saying Ape Abby Phillip asks stupid questions all the time, calling April Ryan a loser, calling Yamish El Senior's question a racist question? Is that the kind of behavior? And then for him to demand respect, is that the kind of behavior a president should be exhibiting? Well, Does I, he embarrass you with what he did today with black women? I don't understand why people keep expecting something different from our president. He's, so, he's consistent. This is him no, all the you time. you answer my question. Now, I'm, you I'm did about answer to. my question. I'm about Are to. you, Kim? I'm about to Are answer you. Are you embarrassed by Donald Trump's attack on these three professional black women? Am I embarrassed by what Donald Trump does? No. I'm embarrassed about maybe what I would do or my husband, but Donald Trump does not affect me as far as embarrassment. Now, I will say... Okay, how about I, this here? I am not finished. Are you ashamed of, are, are you <laughs> oh ashamed of Donald Trump's conduct in, in how he is treating three black female journalists? 
I believe the way he spoke to Miss Phillips was wrong. That was very wrong, and I actually feel really bad that that happened to her. Now, I will say on my personal account, when I met the president, he was nothing but very nice to me. And I wish somebody could go I'm to my iPad. I'm not talking about when you we met the president. We could go to all the pictures that we I'm not together. talking about when you met the president. Kim, I'm going <laughs> to... Kim, this is very simple. Yes. I, if I ask you oh, before I go to Eugene, Ryan. if President oh. Kim, yes. Kim, if President Obama talked that way to a female conservative reporter, would you have the same reaction you're having right now? Absolutely not. President Obama didn't speak this way. That would be shocking. He's a consistent as well. He's very respectful in the way he talks to people. President Trump talks to people all the very same way. So I'm not shocked. This is not shocking. I mean, we're going to 2019. This is President Trump. You either like it or you don't. And, that's true. Well, Eugene, and that's the point right there. When people like Kim say it's not shocking, they have allowed this to become the norm, and it's an abomination how he <laughs> treats black female reporters. I, Eugene? I, I, I agree. Um, you know, Abby Phillips, uh, you know, Yamish and uh, April, you know, they're folk that have not just change the narrative and change the game when it comes to black, come to black female reporters. There are folk that, you know, we black Republicans reach out to and help us get our story out there, help us, you know, strengthen some of our negotiating hands um, when it comes to some things. Um, so I do think it's absolutely wrong, you know, and, and I do think it's actually interesting that the president can, you know, find time for racism when it comes to a question about white nationalists, but, you know, you know, it's both sides when it comes to Charlottesville. And it's both sides when it comes to everything else. But you ask him a question about white nationalism, and is, if he's stroking it and throwing gas on those flames, it's, oh, that's racist. Um, which, you know, is, is a, is a uh, tactic of <laughs> white nationalists. <laughs> Play out your comment before I go to a break. Well, let's be clear. Um, clearly, Trump does not know the definition of racism because asking him a question about him making a comment about being a nationalist is not racist. And that sister who asked the question would have a difficult time given her position in this country as a black woman compared to people who are in power in this country being racist. I mean, she can't be racist, so he, he doesn't know that. But, you know, a lot of white supremacists always try to deflect their white supremacy racism with calling somebody else racist, and it's often irrational and ridiculous. But what, what always blows my mind about Trump that he looks like a child. He acts like a, a spoiled child who's who who had his candy bar taken away from him on a high on a, on an elementary school campus, and he's a, he's a child. But another issue that I constantly think about is that one of the first things that Nancy Pelosi said, now that there's more Democrats in the House, is we're not going to touch uh, or or do any kind of investigations or mess with Trump, not unless Republicans advise us to. That don't make no sense either. That makes about as much sense as. Uh, Trump accusing the sister of racism. Why would you wait for Trump's cronies to push the button on his impeachment, to, 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 to consider impeachment? So there's a lot of mixed stuff going on here. And frankly, why some people back off from the voting process is because of these kind of optical contradictions. All right. Hold tight one second. Going to a break right now. We'll be back with more Roller Bark Unfiltered broadcasting live from Afrotech here in San Francisco. Back in a moment. You have to expect things of yourself before you can do them. Basketball star Michael Jordan. All right, folks, HBCU Giving Day, hashtag HBCU Giving Day. We're always, of course, focused on uh, supporting HBCUs all across the country. Uh, and let me go ahead and pull this up. I'm looking for it on my script right now because uh, I am not there. Uh, of course, we're um, focused on Selma University, located in Alabama, founded in 1878. Uh, and, of course, uh, they are some of the famous members, Maddie Moss Clark, 
gospel choir director and the mother of the famous Clark sisters. Uh, and so, please, we want you to support uh, Selma University. Uh, sorry, folks, they don't have the they don't have the website uh, on the script, uh, and so I can't tell you exactly which one to give to. Uh, so. I want you guys to, of course, uh, follow the screen there. Uh, finally, finally, tell me, selmauniversity.edu. Uh, uh, okay, first of all, I can't even hear what they even telling me. It should be in the script. Okay, follow us on the screen. Support Selma University by giving to them. And, again, we encourage all the graduates of the university uh, to give as well because we're trying, of course, to do all we can to support our HBCUs. Also, folks, now some words from one of our partners. You've heard me talk about uh, our friends at Transatlantic Real Estate who created a unique investment opportunity that combines legal marijuana and crowdfunding. Now, if you think about that for a second, uh, you look at the growing momentum taking place all across the country around legal marijuana. Uh, you've seen initiatives passed in various states that have been on the ballot. Now, if you're an investor, there's an opportunity for you to really make uh, lots of money to get in the game. Now, however, as markets continue to grow, it's going to be harder to get into this particular uh, industry. Uh, of course, it may cost millions and billions. What Transatlantic has done is offered a unique way. Uh, what they're doing is allowing people to be able to invest anywhere from $300 or $10,000 uh, on uh, in, in terms of the purchasing of a farm. Now, let me explain that again. What they do is they buy land that supports marijuana grow operations and lease it to licensed high-paying tenants. So what that means is you're actually going to be a landlord of a licensed marijuana farm. And, again, this is all used by crowdfunding. And then what they're doing is make it easy for the average person to be able to get into this business before they take the company public. So for a limited time, as I said, you can invest anywhere from 300 bucks up to $10,000 uh, to get involved. Now, here's what you must do. You must complete and confirm your application to participate in the opportunity, okay? Complete your application, confirm your application, complete and confirm your application to participate. And you don't want to miss out. So go to MarijuanaStock.com, MarijuanaStock.com to get in the game. All right, folks, let's talk. Let's just say it again. Okay, I said, I said dot .org. I don't know why they keep talking to me in the control room. I said marijuanastock.org. Org. I got it. All right, y'all. Michelle Obama, her memoir is coming out, uh, and excerpts have already started being dropped uh, in the book. And one of the ones uh, that's uh, pretty clear where she says she will never forgive Donald Trump for being a birther. Here's what she said, quote, the whole thing was crazy and mean-spirited, of course. Uh, it's underlying bigotry and xenophobia hardly concealed, but it was also dangerous, deliberately meant to stir up the wing nuts and cooks. Cooks, what if someone with an unstable mind loaded a gun and drove to Washington? What if that person went looking for our girls? Donald Trump, with his loud and reckless innuendos, was putting my family's safety at risk, and for this, I'd never forgive him. Let me go also uh, throw in there, uh, Kim, uh, you also, first of all, before I go to you, now on his way to Paris at the White House, Trump was asked about what Michelle Obama wrote, and then not being man enough, being gutless to address her, he attacks President Obama. Oh, well, Michelle Obama said that I haven't seen it. I guess she wrote a book. She got paid a lot of money to write a book. And they always insist that you come up with controversial. Well, I'll give you a little controversy back. I'll never forgive him for what he did to our United States military by not funding it properly. It was depleted. Everything was old and tired. And I came in and I had to fix it. And I'm in the process of spending tremendous amounts of money. So I'll never forgive him for what he did to our military. I'll never forgive him for what he did in many other ways, which I'll talk to you about in the future. But what he did, because she talked about safety, what he did to our military made this country very unsafe for you and you and you. Okay, so here's the deal, guys. I cannot hear the audio back in the control room So uh, because uh, we lost a little power here. So what I want you all to do, I want you all to uh, dial my iPad so I can hear. Uh, then I will hear it that way. But let me go to you, let me go to you Kim, first. Um, first of all, it's not just Donald Trump, Kim, uh, who uh, was out there as a birther. Even Melania Trump uh, was, was also involved in the birtherism. What do you make of Michelle Obama saying that she is she cannot forgive Donald Trump for what he did by leading the birther issue? Kim, you first. 
Sure. So you never let me talk. This is the same thing I see every time I come on the show. But I wanted to say, when you were talking about black women in media, today, Harris Faulkner, a black woman, was recognized for having the only cable news show, and that's on Fox News. So since we're talking about okay, black Kim, women in media, I want to talk Kim, about Harris Faulkner as well. Good job, Kim, Harris. we're not talking about Harris now, Faulkner having a television as as show. Can you stay on topic? Well, because you didn't let me speak last time. As far as Michelle Obama, this is really yeah, sad. This about? is We're the headline they Fox picked from News. Michelle Obama's well, book. Michelle Obama is a very accomplished woman, and they're talking about the birther. I'm sure her memoir was talking a lot about a lot more than just that. Why can't why can't you why can't you answer the question? Why I can't you did. answer the question about what Michelle Obama said about being the birther? And you jumped to Fox News and that's like, right. What the hell? Yes. Harris because Faulkner we were talking about show? black women in media, and you guys like to gloss no, we were over not. other no, black we were not, women Kim. in media. No, we're not, Kim. Kim, yes. no, we were not. Kim, we were oh, discussing. Did you mention we Harris Faulkner today? Donald Trump atta- Kim, I missed it. Kim, we were discussing Donald Trump attacking three black female mm-hmm. White House correspondents. Yes. Not, a, not an anchor sitting in New York. Okay, that's great. But I wanted to mention her accomplishment. She is a black woman in media. Wow, okay. Well, guess what? Uh, we could also mention uh, Arthel Neville, who is a black woman in media yep. who works at Fox News. Yes. Any other black women at Fox News you want to mention? Do you want to mention a black woman over at CNN? Let's mention Frederica Whitfield, who's an anchor on the weekend. Hmm. Oh, Let's I don't Joy really Rita, watch CNN, MSNBC. so I couldn't tell you who's over there. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> no, you don't want to actually answer the question. You want to spin as No, to you do never let me answer Eugene. my questions. You try to talk over me and try to beat no, me Kim, into these you, little Kim, fights. Kim, you and don't want to be on it's topic. Cute, but I'm a real woman. I'm intelligent. Kim, and I like you to don't speak even want to be on topic. I am on topic. Michelle okay, Obama, Kim, congratulations I'll, on your book. I'll let you answer, Kim. Answer this question. Answer this question. Michelle Obama said she will never forgive Donald Trump for his birtherism. Mm-hmm. What do you think about what she said and that Melania Trump was also a birther? Also a birther. Go. She can't forgive him. Well, uh, that's fine. That's her opinion. I hope she's able to forgive and move on and live a happy life. I mean, <laughs> it's all about Eugene. forgiveness. <laughs> so, so, so what, Eugene. <laughs> In, in terms of, birth, of the birtherism, um, the one thing that I got my start by with a guy named Dan Bongino, who's a former Secret Service agent. Um, one thing that Dan used to drill in about when he speak about Barack Obama is that it's hard fact that when Barack Obama was elected president, the Secret Service saw not a 100, not a 200, not a 300, but a 400 percent spike in threats against the president of the United States. So you know, I I, I don't fault Michelle Obama for not forgiving you know, Donald Trump for, you know, his birtherism, and damn sure don't falter for not forgiving, you know, Melania Trump, who has anchor parents here, uh, you know, came in via chain migration uh, for her birtherism. Um, you know, they both stroke, you know, white nationalist uh, 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 tendencies they, uh, and, right. and, 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 made the, and, and put the safety of the, first, of the former first family at risk. Cleo, go ahead. Uh, Michelle has a book out. She wants to sell books. People are anticipating a Trump critique. And I think that Michelle would put it in there because it's guaranteed to get some clickbait, if you will, or or conversational bait, which we fell for the bait. Um, (laughs) I don't think that people um, who are considering power, political decisions, who's going to be the governor, et cetera, based on democracy, are tripping off of Michelle and her anger or lack thereof toward the, the Trumps. It, to me, it's a, it's a uh, way of getting attention to her book. Well, first, I mean, obviously, that's what she does because uh, she got you writing a book. But I'll tell you right now, uh, I'm with her 1000% uh, because one of the reasons why I will never stay at a Donald Trump hotel ever again. After he after that birther crap, uh, I told CNN point blank, uh, I was I was not going to stay at any of his hotels, just play at any of his properties, because what he actually did with that birther crap was despicable. And his wife also, Melania Trump, she also owes the Obama apology for her being involved in birtherism as well. That was that was that was absolutely shameful. And I'm not going to sit here and then dance like Kim and bring up Harris Faulkner. To talk, we were talking about, uh, well, you should, because, because she's an accomplished no black woman whatsoever. in media. 
Okay, but it has nothing to do with the topic. So, Kim, the way this thing works, you don't go, Kim, let's be real clear. You don't go on Fox News and just all of a sudden bring up something that had nothing to do with the topic. So if you're not going to do it on Fox News, you're not going to do it here. Do you ever br well, bring up April? Well, Roland, I would News? like to say that Fox News gives me a chance to speak. I can finish my complete thought on Fox News. Oh, no, no, News. you get a chance I to speak. I never get that I, chance fact, here. I asked you a question. Well, I you asked know, you a question about I the Wall Street Journal article. I never even got to answer article. about said, April Ryan. Oh, my God. You said, oh, my God, when did the article come out? I didn't even read Don't it. Don't so act when I like read I'm some valley comment. girl. <laughs> no, no, no. That's what you sound like. Oh, my. I, I do mean, not. I don't act like a valley girl. Okay. <laughs> Look. <laughs> I right. do not. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, you want okay. to do yours? All right. I'm, I'm going to ask you're, you about the story good. here. Please, I want to start with you. Uh, Mrs. Miss, like, oh, my God. Like, I'm in San Francisco. You, you should haters. be here with me. Everybody's a valley girl. Haters. Oh, my God. What's going on here? Haters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gotcha. Get Cleo, I want to ask you about this here. Mississippi Mississippi hospital worker and former cop Clayton Hickey. Uh, guess what? Another white man, no job today. This idiot wore a Confederate flag with a noose on the T-shirt to the polls on Tuesday that said Mississippi Justice. Well, the hospital he worked at says you got to go. Well, the hospital has to do that because they have to CYA and, you know, that's pretty inappropriate that he did that, frankly, but I'm from the school of, I like when white people are blatant and clear about their perspective as opposed to getting in my face, not telling the truth and acting like they have another perspective. I think that's why we always get these polls wrong or we believe in them and are shocked when they come out different than what we expect, like with Hillary, like with Gillum, like with Stacey, because we think that people say what they really mean and they don't. I'm talking about people among whites who really want to keep white power sustained, but they'll claim publicly that they're going to vote for the black candidate. So I, I prefer people like this guy, you know, who are going to wear their flag on the, on the front of their shirt so we can know what's going on. But, of course, he's going to be fired. I mean, the hospital wants to stay in business, too. Okay, Kim, <laughs> you get to talk about the dude wearing a T-shirt with a noose saying <laughs> Mississippi Justice. You Should he been fired? Of course. You think I'm going to defend a racist? Not publicly. No, Are you serious? I asked you a question. <laughs> okay, do you want to talk or not? She, 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 I asked you a question. This, this is I'm a just, joke. I'm just She's not Malik. This is a joke. Malik. This is a joke. You can go to somebody Kim, else. Kim, I asked you the question. Kim, Kim, I asked you the question. Should it be fired or not? Absolutely, That's question. Roland. And I said yes. She said yes. No, but these are complaining. Like, oh, you thought I wouldn't say that? Eugene, go ahead. The thing is this, um, you know, what we saw on Election Day, we saw a lot of despicable things in Mississippi. But the fact of the matter is this, you know, we got one more chance to clap back on a lot of the racism in Mississippi. There's three weeks, three weeks from now, there's a runoff election. Mike Espy uh, has a real shot at winning that U.S. Senate seat. So we really need, you know, black voters and, uh, and you know, Republicans of conscience in Mississippi to really come out on the 27th, on, on, at, at the end of November uh, for the runoff election and help, you know, elect the fourth black U.S. Senator uh, to the United States Senate. United States Senate. Well, again, uh, for the folks for the folks who defend that racist flag, these are the kind of guys out there. This is the stuff they believe in and mm -hmm. the stuff that they do. Uh, and so it's nonsensical. And so again, what I keep saying to all the white folks, folks in America, if y'all keep messing up and y'all keep doing this stuff and keep losing jobs, I got no problem replacing y'all with black people. Yep. So please keep screwing up. <laughs> okay, all right, folks, that's it for us. Uh, let's see, uh, Kim. Anything else you want to bring up that's not on the agenda since we are now in new business? Sure. Yes, I would like to say for all those. It's like that... in a meeting, old business and new business. <laughs> for all those that are always shocked about anything what President else, Trump says, you know, you shouldn't be shocked. He is consistent in who he is. Is he always right in what he does? No, he is not. But I would like to say that you should not be shocked, and also. I see a lot of people holding him to a higher standard than their own baby daddy. And to me, if you really think that President no, Trump... They're not. Yes, there are people that do. President Trump is his own person. We should be about legislation and furthering and advancing the black community. You shouldn't be worrying about President Trump and every little word he says. Well, we're not worried about every little word he do says. You actually, worry about him calling black women racist. Do you actually believe the stuff you say? I believe it wholeheartedly. Cleo, I got to give you the final comment. Go ahead, Super Black. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, I'm just going to be repetitive in saying that we're in the era of the irrational white supremacist in chief. 
So every, I have to agree with what she said in terms of what else will we expect from Trump. Trump has been consistent. What's amazing, if you look at it logically, not if you look at it logically, it's not amazing, but what's amazing is that this man was acting like this before he became the president of the United States, and he became the president of the United States after grabbing vaginas, et cetera. So come on, a man is consistent. You got to give him that. I mean, he's going to be a jerk and say stupid stuff and act like a child on the on, on those kids with the little beanie on their head who's, who's pouting, a pouting, angry white supremacist. And he's particularly upset right now because he wanted, he wanted his people to railroad Atlanta and railroad Georgia. And, it, and, and that's kind of ambiguous whether, that's, whether he's going to get away with that dream or not. So he's, he's upset. And maybe that woman who he confronted at the news conference looked too much like Stacey Abrams to him. <laughs> so he went off on her. You know, who knows what's going on with crazy, with crazy Trump? He's being Trump. That's all I got to say. Well, he is being Trump. And let me tell you right now, like I said, the reason I don't call him President Trump is because the day he decides to respect the office, then I will respect the office. I've always respected the office, but this man has no respect for the office of president. And so how he treats people and talks to people is a shame and abomination. I'm not going to make any excuses for him. Uh, and so I'm going to blast him at every turn. And so what he said about Abby Phillip, what he said about April Ryan, what he said to Yamiche Alcindor, uh, how he treated uh, Jim Acosta, what he, th what this man is, uh, he is an ingrate in terms of how he treats people. He consistently lies. Uh, he lies on people. He makes stuff up. Hell, even in that whole point where he made up, uh, the, he, he made up a Fox News poll saying 40 percent of black people uh, uh, approve him in the country. I emailed the White House and said, "Can y'all please show me any evidence where he got that from?" Guess what? They haven't responded to that email uh, in several days. And so it's very simple. Donald Trump, how he disrespects people, how he disrespects black women. John Kelly is shameful because he never apologized to Fred Frederica Wilson for lying on her from the White House podium. And I will not make excuses and normalize how this man treats women. He does not treat them with respect or decency. And so if he wants somebody to respect the White House and the office of president, he needs to learn to respect the American people. Thank our panel there. I appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Thank all the folks who were here uh, at Afrotech. Again, folks, uh, it is a packed conference of 4,000 people. Follow them on Instagram, on Twitter as well, uh, Afro.Tech on Instagram. You can follow them uh, at Afrotech uh, on um, Twitter as well. They have videos and postings, things along those lines. Great to see so many African-Americans in technology here at the conference. Right now, you see behind me, uh, Valicia Butterfield-Jones. Uh, who is with uh, Google. Uh, she's interviewing on stage former Obama senior advisor uh, Valerie Jarrett. And so uh, I'm going to go check out and see what they have to say. Folks, don't forget, subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. Also, uh, we want you to support us there as well. Uh, share to join, uh, share our clips. Join our fan club. That's right. Join our fan club, the Bring the Funk fan club. I want you to go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Uh, we're trying to get 20,000 of our followers to give at least 50 bucks uh, a year to support this effort because we are bringing you information nobody else is bringing you. And so we're certainly glad to have all of you here. Thanks for watching. We had a great time. Detroit, I will see you guys tomorrow. I speak 9.30 a.m. So let me jump on this red eye in about seven hours. And so Motown, I'll see you guys. Y'all take care. Holla!